This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg. Our podcast, Spirit Matters, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. We're also a um, YouTube channel. And so if you go to YouTube and put in Spirit Matters Talk, those three words uh, will come up. Uh, we have um, a large body of archives, almost 300 interviews. Uh, uh, and uh, we, our focus is contemporary spirituality. And uh, I want to thank first those folks out there that have helped keep us on the air by contributing to us. And you can go to spiritmatterstalk.com and find out more about that. But for today, uh, we are very pleased, very excited to have on our show uh, Swami Tiagananda, who is a monk of the Ramakrishna order. He is head of the Vedanta Society in Boston and is the Hindu chaplain at MIT and Harvard. Wow, quite, quite an illustrious uh, uh, background and, and, and uh, profession you have. Prior to coming to the United States, Swami uh, was for 11 years the editor of the English language journal Vedanta Kishari, uh, based in Chennai, India. Uh, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on and fill about his book. Well, very happy to be here, yeah. The I book, happen to have it. His latest deeply. book, Looking <laughs> Deeply, which is uh, his translation and commentary on the uh, Viveka Dumani. Uh, no, Vivek, Viveka Kudamani. Very good. Chudamani. <laughs> Chudamani. Uh, of Shankara, and we want to talk about that, uh, Swamiji. Um, but first, um, uh, we always ask our guests to give a little of their own spiritual background. And in the case of uh, a renunciate like yourself, uh, I'm always curious how you, because we're going to be talking about discernment, how you discerned your calling when you are presumably a, a young man in India? And in my case, it, it happened pretty naturally in some ways. Uh, uh, I was very lucky that my mother, she brought me books of Swami Vivekananda when I was just about 10 years old. She had gone in an all India pilgrimage along with her mother, that my grandma. And then when they visited Belurmat in Calcutta, which is the headquarters, of the Vedanta movement. So she picked up these booklets of Vivekananda's quotations. And I was just 10 years old. English was not even my first language. And she brought it and I started reading them. And now when I look back, I'm a little bit amused because I don't even know how much I understood or what I read. But those were not specifically books meant for children per se. But I think I was very attracted to the personality of Vivekananda and somehow instinctively was caught by that message. And then as a teenager, then when I grew a little bit older, I started reading these books. Even then I wasn't particularly thinking that I'm going to be a monk. I mean, I'm just attracted to the teachings. That's what I thought about. But I was also alongside reading Perry Mason. I was thinking of being a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and I started reading Sherlock Holmes books and I thought I'll be a detective. And, you know, just the kind of the different fancies that we have as children. So when I think around when I was probably 16 or 17, I told my parents, I think I'll be a monk. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because before that they had heard me say, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. So I don't think they took it very seriously. Uh, so when I'd gone to the monastery, the first time I saw it, I really felt it to be, oh, this is the place. Um, and essentially, that's how it happened. It, this whole calling, it wasn't very anything very dramatic in the sense of some supernatural experience or anything like that. It, it just happened in a very natural way. And so after I graduated, the very next day after my exams, actually, I joined the monastery. And I've been very lucky that uh, I've never had to, never had second thoughts about the choice that I've made. So I've been very fortunate. But again, it was it was a very natural, organic process. Well, being being a monk in your uh, parampara is not unlike being a detective. <laughs> well, <laughs> in the inner inner examination, true. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I, a couple of things I, I wanted to mention before we get into the, the new book. Uh, the, for those not familiar with the Vedanta Society, um, uh, I, I'm familiar with it because I, I visited, uh, I think you have a temple or a center uh, near Santa Barbara. And yeah. um, <clears throat> it, it's a beautiful setting and it's a beautiful building, very simple. And, uh, but when you walk in, there's a tremendous feeling of power, of, a feeling of silence. But, but a lively, vibrant silence. And it was uh, quite remarkable. And I've heard that from other people and it really took me. So whatever, what, what, what they represent, uh, the Vedanta Society, is not just uh, some intellectual understandings or concepts or philosophies, but it, it's very experiential. And they have their procedures and practices for spiritual development. Uh, but for anyone that uh, walks into one of their centers, um, even somebody, I'm, I don't consider myself particularly alert, uh, they, they, they really feel that. So uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. The, the question I wanted to ask, though, is uh, you've been the, um, the chaplain at, at Harvard and MIT in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, what, what is that like? Uh, what do students come and, and ask you about uh, spirituality and uh, what, what was that? Is that experience what you anticipated it would be like when you first began it? And, and uh, give us some sense of what that experience is, has been for you. Not particularly different from my life in the monastery here. I mean, essentially, the people who come to the monastery of, of a different age groups. And if I'm on campus, the age group is kind of there of the younger, younger mm -hmm. age. But essentially, the questions that they come with, the, the issues they want to discuss with me, are not that different. <clears throat> so I, I just see my work on the two campuses, Harvard and MIT, as an extension of the work that I'm already doing in a larger community. There's, in general, of course, there is a greater skepticism against organized religion among the younger generation. I mm -hmm. see that more in the West than I saw it in India. And I think it's oftentimes it's a very healthy skepticism, which I greatly appreciate. And Vedanta actually appreciates that kind of a, a questioning attitude, not accepting anything just blindly, just because some elderly person or some person whom you admire or someone whom you're just saying it. It's better to test everything and accept only what resonates with our own head and heart. Swami, uh, speaking of being the uh, chaplain at Harvard, uh, just yesterday I read that the new head of the chaplaincy department at Harvard is the secular humanist chaplain uh, who uh, calls himself an atheist. And I, I, I met him once, he's a terrific guy, but uh, I wonder if you have anything to say about that. I'm sure you, you know, you're, you're, you're close to him. And, and what, does, what is that, uh, what are the implications of, her, of him being named uh, into that position? I think there's been too much of a media brouhaha over that. <laughs> Uh, because, and I think the media got it wrong in many ways. Yeah. I mean, they characterize it as the chief chaplain, someone who oversees 40 other religious constituencies. It's nothing of the sort. It's not a university appointment. The chaplains, there is no chaplaincy department at Harvard. Yeah. So the Harvard chaplain is a group. They are independent group mm -hmm. who are actually volunteering to help uh, enrich the religious and spiritual life on campus. So none of the chaplains is an employee of Harvard. And so, so these chaplaincy group, they have a, a, a committee, an executive committee, and they have uh, officers almost always, not almost always, always uh, chosen unanimously. It's a one-year term and get renewed for another year. I mean, I, I, I was in the position that Greg is now, I was in that position for two years, in 2001 and 2002. Actually, the 9-11 occurred during my watch. Oh. I had to lead a university-wide service. 
but none of us saw ourselves like the chief chaplain that 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 post doesn't exist so that, because of the way it was got reported in new york times and others uh, it made a big sensation so yeah yeah it, it sounds like a, a big story uh, but uh, when you look at it there are many many people who could consider themselves spiritual but not religious does that make those people atheists or well, maybe you know and so then they can run with that and then there are those people that dislike harvard and this is a way for them to uh uh to attack it or or attack humanism or whatever so so yes i my guess is that it's been exaggerated and what would be interesting uh is to uh take this idea of what he represents what he says uh and 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 have an exchange between um the the different various religious groups people that consider themselves religious believers in god people that consider themselves agnostic that aren't sure and and i know um, we have on our show had a lot of people involved in interfaith i know phil has been very involved in all of that and it's bringing people together to think about these things so it could be very stimulating and very inclusive and something for people to share ideas and to stimulate ideas and maybe somebody moves from spiritually uh inclined to religious or religious to spiritually inclined or whatever uh, so I think that, that everyone is open to that, but that's what I believe and what I would like to see encouraged, as opposed to these people believe this and you don't believe that. And it's just, again, folks, uh, and often in the media, it happens trying to uh, divide. Yeah, I mean, I, I have had discussions with many eight days and, and Greg, Greg is a good friend of mine and, mm -hmm. you know, the wonderful person. So oftentimes when eight days say, I don't believe in God. And I oftentimes respond to that by saying, which God you don't believe in? <laughs> because we, we or the, I mean, the, we can only reject what we know. We cannot right. reject what we don't know. So when they are rejecting God, they are only rejecting the kind of God that they have been exposed to in their life. And so when I ask them, what kind of God you don't believe in? What is it? Which God you are rejecting? And then they mention, oh, this God, blah, blah, blah. This doesn't make sense to us, et cetera. And I tell them, well, I don't believe in that God either, but I don't see. So that kind of opens up the discussion that it's possible for me to reject the kind of God they are rejecting. And yet I don't see myself as an atheist. And that kind of, that, that generates good discussion. Yeah. Swami, uh, I'd like to turn to your, uh, your book, uh, Looking Deeply. Um, Hold that up still so we can see it a little better, yeah. As I as I mentioned in my <laughs> got it <laughs> when when we introduced you, it's uh, a translation and commentary on Shankara. <clears throat> so uh, I have a lot of questions, but first, um, for the benefit of listeners and viewers who don't know who Shankara was, or maybe they've heard the term Adi Shankaracharya or his name, perhaps you can tell us. Uh, something you know of Shankar's of the history, but uh, briefly, but his importance. In yes. The... So, so Shankara was a great Vedanta teacher in the eighth century. He was born in seven eighty eight of a common era. He um, so he is seen as a philosopher, but also a great mystic, and one whom they see as an enlightened being. And one of his lasting contributions was writing commentaries on the basic texts of Vedanta. And not that everyone agreed with what he had to say. So there, there are other teachers who came after him, other great teachers who came after him. Um, so some of them agreed with what he had to say, some of them disagreed. And so that's how these competing schools of thought appeared in Vedanta. But the his greatness lay in that that anyone who came after him had either to agree with him or disagree with him they could not ignore him they could not pretend as if he didn't exist so now 1300 years after him he is still a big name and he name is generally associated with the non dualistic thought non dualistic interpretation of the vedantic tradition 
if I can follow up, Dennis, uh, he, he is also, um, actually, when I think he, he died at, at age 33, and it's, it boggles the mind how much he accomplished in those times, he, not only the writing and the commentary, but traveling the length and breadth of India in those days, before railroads even, and um, establishing the monastic orders that still exist, that uh, mm -hmm. still carry great uh, stature. <laughs> and if I'm, my observation is that every, every Swami I've ever known about somehow traces the, his lineage back to Shankara, even though it, there are so many branches and tributaries. Is that a, an accurate observation? Not exactly tracing it back to Shankara, it actually goes even beyond Shankara. So the Hindu monastic tradition is very old, much older than even Shankara. Mm -hmm. But Shankara was the one who systematized the existing monastics into 10 orders. And that is why the, the, the names that the Vedanta monks have today, they align themselves with at least one of these 10 orders. And so the lineage goes through Shankara, but to beyond that. And so this lineage, oftentimes many of the older Upanishads do mention this lineage. And then it goes back mentioning some of the rishis or the sages or the Vedas. Yeah. And interestingly, ultimately ends up with either Shiva or Vishnu, meaning ultimately the, the, the spiritual teacher is God himself. So ultimately the divine being is the teacher mm -hmm. and that power of that wisdom gets transformed, transferred from one tradition to another. So that the other teachers who come after are more instruments through which that wisdom flows. That is how they see it. Yeah. But my understanding, Swami, is that uh, uh, Shankara uh, established four seats North, east, south, and west, and those seats are held by uh, a Shankaracharya, a leader in that area. And it is possible that a seat may be vacant for a certain period of time if it's felt the appropriate person is not available to fill that seat. <clears throat> are you aligned with one of those particular Shankaracharyas? And is there any differentiation between north, east, south, and west, or is it just more administrative? Yeah, they are. They are pretty much independent in many ways. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not a very highly centralized organization. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the four Shankaracharyas kind of plan things together or anything like that, it isn't like that. And so the, the lineage usually flows through one of these four seats. So now Ramakrishna's guru was Tota Puri. So he belongs to that Puri Sampradaya. Puri is one of those 10 denominations in which Shankara had systematized the monastic orders. And so the Puri denomination is that which is given in this southern uh, center which Shankara started in a place called Shringeri. Mm -hmm. And so, so Shringeri holds a, a, a little bit extra significance for me because my lineage flows through that center. I have to say, um, I was in Shringeri at the monastery uh, just right before the pandemic hit. And um, I would highly recommend to anybody who's uh, a true seeker to visit the, the Shringeri uh, uh, temple and monastery. It's an exquisite, beautiful place with, that, that feels very, very deep. Um, <clears throat> Swami, the book, when I received it, I realized it's um, a translation and commentary of what I understood to be or knew by the title Crest Jewel of Discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I still have, mm -hmm. you can see how torn it is. Mm -hmm. copy well read, well read, yeah. Mm -hmm. that I, I've had this for about 50 years Wow! in all the places I've gone. And it's a commentary by uh, Swami Prabhavananda with the help of Christopher Isherwood yeah. in your 
lineage from the <laughs> Vedanta press. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it had a big impact on me back in the day. So I'm curious why you took on the, the task of, of doing a, a, a new uh, translation and commentary and how it might differ from, from the others. Um, the most kind of a mundane reason of why I did this is because I'm going to give a class on Viveka Chudamani in Boston beginning on the middle, the second week of this month on September 22nd, I think, third week. And so oftentimes I found when I give a class on Sanskrit texts, um, very few among the audience have studied Sanskrit. And so clearly they have to follow a, a translation. And in my previous experience about speaking on Sanskrit texts, the discussion usually centers around the translation and I have to keep on explaining the translation more than the text itself. Mm -hmm. And, and then I thought, well, if I have to explain the translation, rather than me trying to figure out why the translator used a certain word instead of some other word, a certain phrase, rather than some other phrase, um, it's better that, uh, let me just translate it myself, so I'll be able to explain it better, because at least then I know definitely why a certain <laughs> word was translated mm -hmm. in a certain way. So that's the kind of a mundane reason. But I think, a deeper reason also would be, I think it's good for these ancient texts to be translated afresh in every generation, um, because that's how the newer insights, newer interpretations would come, which may not necessarily be radically new from the older translations, but I think it's helpful. And I think the word discrimination itself is a good example of that. I think 50 years ago, 70 years ago, the word Viveka in, in English, in Sanskrit, uh, often got translated as discrimination in, in most of our older literature. Now, I mean, it's a good word, it's a good translation, but we know that discrimination also has a kind of a negative connotation right. today. So we say, don't discriminate, we tell people. And then you read a Vedanta book and says, you must discriminate. Then it's like, wait a minute, what are they saying? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so I found that I, consistently translate the word as discernment in my book. Uh, and I felt that at least this word would not create that kind of a confusion in someone who is new to Vedanta. Uh, Swami, uh, those that read your book can come, some will have uh, a tremendous background in, in what you're uh, uh, presenting in the book. Uh, others will have no background in it. What do you uh, hope uh, is accomplished by someone, what do you want people to get from reading the book? How do you want the, the book to affect them? I just, I just want people to just, <clears throat> to, to just question themselves. Some of the mm -hmm. things that we take for granted that better to ask the kind of questions we may have never asked before. The things that we may have assumed, we have to kind of question our assumptions. And one of the common assumptions is, this is who I am, and this is the world. And this world has always been the way it is. And what this book, and that's why it's titled Looking Deeply. If I look deeply at myself, do I see something different? It's like um, you look at a tree, you, and then you see a tree. That's kind of obvious. But if you kind of, you look at it more deeply, then you begin to say, oh, this tree has some branches and there are birds sitting on it. And then you look at it even more deeply, then you see some other tiny insects there. And you can see a lot more when you look deeply. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if I look at myself, if I just look at myself superficially, I just see what I stand, what I see when I stand before a mirror. But if I look at myself deeply, then I see a person who has feelings, who has hopes, who has fears, who has concerns. If I look at it even more deeply, what Vedanta says is, I might find something deeper, profound, the real me. And so that is what discernment I see. And then same thing, you look at the world outside. Right. Is this world real or unreal? We just take the reality of the world for granted, but should we question it? Right. Let, let me ask a follow-up question. And that is that if somebody reads the book or, and comes to you and says, yeah, or maybe it, it's contained within the book, 
uh, I, I would like to look at myself more deeply. Uh, are there ways, are there procedures, are there spiritual practices that you can share with me that will assist me in doing that? Absolutely. So that's essentially what the, the book it <clears> deals <throat> with, that my understanding of myself is so superficial. But if I look deeply, I see that I'm covered with layers over the real me. The real me is hidden behind. And so there are meditations prescribed in the book which show how these layers can be removed so that I get mm -hmm. in touch with myself. And then what's the benefit of getting in touch with myself? That all the problems that any of us may have at any point in history, in any part of the world, irrespective of the, uh, the, the race, religion, gender, all of our problems are either connected with the body in some way or the mind. And we see that when we are fast asleep, when we are not even aware of our body and mind, in deep sleep, we have no problem. No one has any problem when they are deep sleep. When we wake up, as if all these problems are sitting by our bedside and they just kind of, once again, I have all these worries. Anxiety. And so Vedanta really says that this experience that I have in deep sleep with free, complete freedom, no limitation, absence of anxiety, worry, fear. But deep sleep is a state of unconsciousness. It just comes naturally. I don't have to worry for, about it. But is it possible to get that same experience I get in deep sleep while I'm conscious when I'm awake? And what this book says is, yes, it's possible to do so. And Shankara himself, Shankaracharya himself was a person who had attained that state. And then he was not, obviously not the only one. So what the Vedanta students believe is that in every generation, there are people who are able to experience that state. So the state of enlightenment, according to this book, is not a post-mortem experience. I mean, in order to go to heaven, we have to die. But in order to be enlightened, it's possible to be enlightened right here, right now. And so that's the very positive, hopeful message that this book gives. And something that every one of us has the ability, the capacity to achieve, if only we take it to heart and work hard for it. Great, Swami, great, thorough answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, two questions. First about the title. I remember reading that... Uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, when uh, he would, he was very fond of saying "go deeper" when he would meet people, <clears throat> I, and that always stuck in my mind. The, the thought of him saying just "go deeper." So I, I want to ask if that influenced your uh, choice of a title. And the other thing I want to ask is uh, about the word discernment. What you what formerly might have been called discrimination. Uh, yeah. I've met a lot of people when they hear the uh, the emphasis on viveka on discernment, they think, oh, it's very intellectual. Yeah. It's about thinking, and spirituality is 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 not about thinking. It's it's beyond thinking, and isn't it also true that the uh, the ultimate uh, union or experience of the of the self is in fact beyond thinking so maybe you could discuss those things for us sure yeah so about the first point yes i'm sure that that was at the back of my mind when i said go deeply in fact there is a bengali song which ramakrishna used to sing often which uh, is a uh, dive deep dive deep on mind that once uh, you the deeper you go there are great treasures in the bed of the ocean so similarly, if we dive deep within our own heart, we may have some great treasures in our own heart we may be unaware of. Um, about reason, yes, the ultimate reality is beyond thinking, beyond reason. In fact, the Upanishads say that the mind and the speech don't reach there. But that doesn't mean that thinking is useless. We need to apply reason as far as reason can take us. And the, 
And there is going to be a point beyond which the reason cannot go. And then from there beyond that is that ultimate reality. But that doesn't mean abandoning thinking right in the beginning. Because even in our day-to-day -day life, we see that thoughtless activities and thoughtless actions can bring a lot of pain and suffering to oneself and to others. And so I think thinking is good. Also, I think about thinking, I want to say a little bit more. And that is, we generally refer to some people as thinkers as if some others don't think at all. And I, I think it's impossible not to think. I think everybody thinks. Even people who decry thinking are thinking about it and then decrying it. <clears throat> so what's the difference then? I think the difference is this. Many people think in a very haphazard manner. They have thoughts, they have ideas, but they are not organized well. And those people whom we say like are thinkers, they also have ideas, but they have a way of connecting those ideas, connecting those concepts into some kind of a beautiful picture. So I don't believe that there is anyone who does not think. I think the only difference is there are people who think in a disciplined way, and there are people who do not think in a disciplined way. But I think everyone thinks. If you have a mind, we are going to think. We are going to feel. We cannot not do it. <laughs> so, so as long as you think, you can at the very least grow toward enlightenment. Um, not necessarily, uh, because <clears throat> uh, if the mind is crooked, then even a crooked mind can think. Mm -hmm. And a crooked mind thinking is not necessarily going to an enlightenment, it's probably going in the opposite direction. And that's why there is so much stress laid on purification of mind. It, there is such a thing as purification of reason, purification of feelings. Because feelings themselves, if they are not purified, can take me in a very destructive path. Reasoning, if it is not purified, can take me in a very destructive path. And so, yeah, merely thinking is not enough. It should be thinking with a purified, clear mind. And, and you also need a, a teacher, a guide. Uh, you, you mentioned purification, but you need a teacher, a guide to bring you uh, along the path. Absolutely. In fact, sometimes when people ask, well, do we really need a teacher? Do we really need a guru? And that question was asked to one of Ramakrishna's disciples. His name was Swami Brahmananda. And he said, even to be a good pickpocket, you need a teacher. <laughs> so if we need a teacher, I mean, very few people question the need to go to school. So if we, if we need a teacher to teach us math or physics or physics or whatever, then it just seems like, oh, spirituality is something I can do on my own. I mean, it's not to say that <clears throat> no one can do it on their own. I mean, there have been extraordinary people, for instance, in the, in the life of Buddha or Ramana Maharshi, and some, I'm sure there are others. We don't see a specific teacher guiding them, but such are exceptions. Most of us, I think, need, need a guidance. And again, it's not so much a kind of a, a category called teacher. I mean, in, to some extent, I would say for most of us, our parents are our first teachers. Mm -hmm. Although we don't see them as teachers, but we learn <clears throat> some of the basics of life in our formative years from the elders under whose care we grow up. Right. So teachers come in different shapes and forms, although we don't necessarily always right. call them teachers. Right, right. I, I'm sure if somebody is going in for a surgery, they want to go to somebody who had a teacher who taught them how to do the surgery and they didn't figure it out on their own. So I, I, I think your example is, 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 is a very good one. Yeah. I decided to open your book at random yeah. and ask you about whatever I hit upon. So I think I, I was led to a very good passage. Mm. It, it, it reads, the reflection of consciousness in in quotes, material entities, such as the intellect, the mind, and the body, is what makes them appear conscious. And we are deluded into thinking of them as self. Yeah. Explain. 
<laughs> well, consciousness is a very interesting topic, and there's of course, you know, there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, I would only say this to to briefly contextualize the topic of consciousness is the way Vedanta sees consciousness as an independent entity. Consciousness is not seen as the byproduct of brain activity. Consciousness is something not necessarily physical, not biological, that the body is conscious, the mind is conscious, but that consciousness doesn't belong to the body. It's, it's like if you have a light bulb and you have a covering over it, and then light, some percolate, light will percolate through that covering, but the light belongs to the bulb, to the electricity, not to the covering. So the body and mind are kind of a covering over the spirit, which is conscious. And so that's, I would say, probably a major point of departure in some ways, the way Vedanta sees consciousness and what the way material sciences see it. The, the good example might be this, that light, for instance, none of us can see light, um, but we can see objects illumined by light. And similarly, consciousness, we know consciousness is present because we are conscious of objects. I'm conscious of this table, I'm conscious of the chair, but it's the chair that depends on consciousness for me to be able to see it. Consciousness does not depend on the chair for its own existence. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, to kind of give a rather uh, simplistic example would be you now sun and its ability to give light. And because of sun's light, we have the days and we can see everything. But the sun doesn't depend on us for its light. Tomorrow, if the, all this planet perishes, the sun would still give light, but, but there would be no, no, none of us here to see that light. So consciousness is like that. Consciousness illumines objects for us. We become conscious of them. But even if there were nothing there, consciousness can still remain. It's independent of any objects. And so when Vedanta speaks of consciousness, as our nature as consciousness, it means that the consciousness, which is consciousness itself, light itself, objectless consciousness. Yeah, Swami, uh, I'm curious. Uh, you, you are the chaplain at Harvard and MIT, and uh, you, you stated that uh, consciousness is independent of uh, brain activity, mm -hmm. uh, that it, it, it exists in and of itself. Uh, and I'm sure you encounter a lot of uh, people in the physical and biological sciences at, at Harvard and MIT. Uh, have you encountered a number of people, say, even neurophysiologists, uh, who, uh, on the one hand, see brain activity having an effect or, or creating um, consciousness, uh, or those that believe it creates consciousness, but that uh, are people who are very developed in these areas of study, but also recognize and believe uh, consciousness to be independent of, of brain activity. You know, I have had discussions with many of them, and it's like this. It's not that they are completely unconnected, but it's like this. The correlation and causation are two different things. So when I, when I see a table, I'm sure there's something happening in my brain. There's some changes right. occurring there. And what material sciences can do, they can only deal with quantifiable, measurable entities. Mm -hmm. So they can see changes occurring in the brain. So there's some, some activity occurs here and I see you in front of me. So there's correlation that these two things are occurring simultaneously, an activity in my brain and my consciousness of you in front of me. But just because these two things are correlated doesn't mean that one is the cause of the other. So this does not itself, by itself, this does not prove that the brain activity is producing that consciousness. All that it's saying is this and that is occurring at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if we want to think in terms of causation, well, either of these could be the cause of the other. There is not, nothing to say that this is the cause of that. And, and do you sometimes recommend that they 
um, engage in some spiritual practice so that they can uh, experience uh, consciousness as, as independent, as separate, as uh, in and of itself. Uh, uh, is, is, if they pursue and really want to understand it better, or might one ask you that, how, is there a way to, to go inward and, and, and actually have that insight and experience? Absolutely. I mean, it's like this. If they want to prove their thesis, they would say, well, come to our laboratory and we can show you this is how mm-hmm. it is. And I would say, that's fine. I'm happy to come there. But then if you want a confirmation for my thesis, then you should do what I'm doing. And I think many of them who are honest debaters, honest discuss- mm-hmm. in discussion, they actually like this approach. And they mm-hmm. say it makes sense. I mean, they may not be there to totally accept it, but they say at least purely theoretically, this position, it's difficult to deny. Yeah. Right. I, I used to teach uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation, in Cambridge. So I encountered a lot of people of that mindset uh, coming in and same thing. And then say, well, just have this experience. And, and, and many of them came in very open to that possibility. Some of them came in just because they wanted to relax a little more. Uh, and, I, and I can't say on every occasion, but on many, many occasions, their insights, their thoughts, their uh, belief in terms of what one was experiencing and consciousness being independent of physiological brain, wave, brain activity, rather, uh, w- was changed. So, and, and some of these people now I know 45 years later, and uh, they, they uh, definitely changed because of having that experience. Yeah. yeah I mean, we could... Yeah, go ahead, yeah. We, we could talk for hours and we'll have to have you back. We need, we need a part two. <laughs> but uh, before we go, I want to tell our listeners, um, I uh, have the uh, great honor of being on a panel with Swami Tiagananda at uh, what was intended to be a conference in Maine, but will now, well, it will be in Maine, but it will be... Uh, online as opposed to a gathering in person uh, called Living Peace, Building Peace from the One Planet Peace Forum. And I want to encourage uh, the listeners. It's a a few hours every day on September 24th, 25th, and 26th. There'll be a series of uh, panels and speakers and you can go to uh, oneplanetpeaceforum.org and uh, register, it's free. And uh, you can hear more from Swami Tiagananda and incidentally from me <laughs> and a number of other speakers uh, if you do, and I'm I'm looking forward to that. Any final words for our listeners, Swami? Or well, I'm I'm looking forward to that conference in Maine as well, and I encourage uh, to, uh, everyone as if you're free, please do come. I think it's a fascinating. I attended that last year, and it was it is a great gathering. And um, thank you, thank you to both of you, Dennis and Phil, for inviting me for this and to share a few thoughts on on Vedanta and also on my book, Looking Deeply. Um, Yeah, it's a great joy to be with you. Hold up the book one more time. (laughs) Yes, uh, thank you so very much. A wonderful discussion and uh, uh, very, very insightful uh, answers. And uh, we look forward to having you back on. All the best. Thank Thank you. you, Swami. Thank you. Phil, that was Swami Tiagananda, a brilliant man. And and think about it, uh, for him to get the appointment he has as the uh, chaplain at uh, Harvard and uh, uh, MIT is, uh, you know, probably probably a lot of people would like that position. I think he was the first Hindu. No, no, wait, wait. He's the Hindu chaplain. They have a bunch of chaplains. Oh, I thought, uh, okay. Makes sense. But I I, I would think now with a lot of Indian students, 
a lot of Asian students in, at MIT and Harvard that, that uh, you know, he has uh, a lot of students that he deals with, yeah. uh, very scholarly. Uh, and I, I thought his, uh, much of what he said, uh, he was dealing with very complex matter. And I thought he articulated it in such a way that it was extremely understandable. So you know, uh, that's exactly what you want when somebody's speaking to college students. You know, the lineage he's from that uh, was started by Swami Vivekananda, in the, who was a disciple of Ramakrishna. They have a history now for 120 some odd years of, um, or more, of um, training swamis who are very astute and very learned and very uh, grounded in the Vedantic literature. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at least the ones I've met mm -hmm. fill that bill and the ones that come to America and run the Vedanta Society centers maybe you know have a, a also a very uh, a good command of English uh, and um, we've had now that's our third Swami from that lineage on the show I've met any number of them I've been to Bellarmut uh, outside Calcutta three times which is where they train uh, the, the the monks and it's a beautiful big almost mm -hmm. university like campus only it has you know mm -hmm. temples and shrines and um and it's also you know a, a, a university of, of sorts and um big emphasis on knowledge and understanding so the book we talked about looking deeply i only had a chance to <laughs> to not look deeply but I'm looking forward to to diving into it because it's a it's a it's I didn't realize it when he sent it to us, but it's um, we talked about it. It's um, his translation and commentary of a classic work by Shankara. Yeah, you know, yeah. very and I, and I think he made a a, a, a good good uh, explanation of why he did the translation. Uh, by by the way, for some many of our listeners who might be uh, not familiar with that lineage. Uh, you talk about Vivekananda uh, quite extensively in your book, American Veda. And, yeah. and I think he was really the first Swami, if I recall from your book, uh, to come to the United States, uh, to Chicago, That's what, 1890-something right. for the Bingo World Conference of Religions? Yeah. 1893, he came to speak at the Parliament of Re World's Religions and stayed a few years and then came back for a short visit. But as he was, he set the template. Mm -hmm. I always say he's the Jackie Robinson of uh, American Veda. Uh -huh. he, he <laughs> all the barriers and set yeah. the template. And, you know, uh, he, 1893, <laughs> you know. That's a, way, that's a ways back. Uh, Says so much. And, and again, you get into this in American Veda. You know, if you use the word karma, uh, dharma, any of those things in the States now or in Europe, uh, people, you know, okay, they have an idea of what you're talking about. Uh, not back then. It was hey, all new. 1893, you know, most Americans hadn't even met a Jew. Yeah, exactly. Even, you know, your ancestors may not have come yet, you know. Right. No, I think they came right after the turn of the century, you know, like 1910 or in that period of time. So that was... That's so way the back people there. People were discriminating against Catholics, right? In those days, let alone Hindus, right? So it's <laughs> it's amazing that uh, maybe because it was so foreign, they felt no threat from it. You know, the well, no, some people did forever. feel a threat, but not the same kind of threat because you know there wasn't a wave of immigrants coming right. in at that time. But but uh, people did uh, respond. Mm -hmm. They were. You know, two reactions. One would have been like the equivalent of people like us who said, hey, you know, let's go hear this guy speak. Right. You know, right. Thing. And, oh, I heard he's great. 
and uh, maybe we can learn something. But the, there were others, especially conservative Christians, who thought he was doing the devil's work. And right. So in some ways, things have changed. In some ways, they haven't. That's uh, let right. me let me ask you this. Uh, I have been to uh, the Vedanta Center, as I mentioned in the interview, uh, near Santa Barbara, in that area. Beautiful, beautiful facility set in the, 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 the hills there, surrounded by trees. Very, the feeling of lively silence, uh, uh, quite profound, like I've experienced in a number of monasteries from uh, di different traditions. Uh, but uh, as I recall, and you would know more, uh, much of the, what they have there is a library of literature, of books, uh, from their tradition. Uh, and I don't know uh, if they run much in the way of instruction and in spiritual practices. Oh, sure or, they do. Uh, yeah. they, some of that must go on there. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. It's a, also a very complete um, library. It's also a convent. Right. It's, it's run by their nuns. The, the women, uh, women monks live there, uh, nuns. And we had one of them on the show. Yeah, uh, of Raja Prana and uh, early on in, in our existence. And uh, she's American. Um, and they, but the Vedanta Society centers uh, in the in more urban settings, like the one here in LA, right. which is legendary. There's one in New York, actually two in New York and um, Boston where Swami Tiagananda is. These are urban centers that are little sanctuaries, but they have ongoing instruction and ongoing, uh, you know, service to their uh, devotees and community and to the public. You know, lectures and Sunday morning things, other evenings during the week, courses, workshops. So it's a, it's an ongoing institution. And it's lasted all these years. I mean, Swami Vivekananda set up the very first one in New York in the 1890s. And mm -hmm. uh, it's not in the same location anymore, but then, you know, there's there's centers everywhere. Right. And I, I'm sure in his book that you can find on our uh, website, uh, we, we'll post all that out, information about those centers and, and, and what they do and where they're located will be available there worldwide. And, One of the uh, interesting yeah. things is um, the this the book we were talking about is used to be called the Crest Jewel of Discrimination, and uh, Swami Tiagananda prefers the word discernment because of the overtones for of right. discrimination. But that quality, which in Sanskrit is is viveka of discernment of, of the mind, of intellect, is a really important quality on the spiritual path. And many uh, teachers uh, don't give it the value that right. it should have. You know, and, 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 and in that, in the Vedantic tradition, discernment means a, you know, a lot more, it's much, much more acute faculty than just right. understanding something. Right, right. You know, you know, he made the point, and I thought it was a, a, a point well taken by us, is about, uh, you know, the importance of having a teacher. And I think sometimes uh, in sort of the world of what we now call new age, or people that are interested in, 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 in um, contemporary forms of spirituality, uh, there's this idea, it's very like, Spirit, spiritual spirituality is like an amorphous blob it's just you know there's nothing to really know it's just some experience that hits you whereas i think uh, in the, the tradition that uh, uh swamiji uh represents discernment discrimination the developed intellect very very important because yes let's have that experience even that experience of being of the absolute which is ineffable but at the same time let's really understand it in every possible way from every angle and let's uh and, and, and this is the Vedic tradition, uh, yeah. you know, and, and uh, the systems of, of Indian philosophy. And, and uh, let's be able to articulate it and explain it. And I think that's important in, in, in handing it down from gener generation to gen generation. So, so I think that uh, what he, he presented is quite profound and important for those that are interested <clears throat> in spiritual development. Which yes, you can make an argument is everyone. 
it, and it's it's a very paradoxical situation because um, the 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 teachers who are saying you don't need teachers are teachers, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and people come to them because they presumably know more than they do. We need you know people who know more than we do, and the best of the teachers, the best of the gurus. Uh, teach you in such a way that you become more and more self-sufficient and less and right. less dependent on them. Right. But that's the job of a teacher, just like it's right. the job of a parent to raise you so that you can eventually go out on right. your own. You know, right. so we need them. Yeah, great, great, great guest. I, I hope to have him back up on again. Perhaps still, I don't have a copy of the book in front of me. If you could hold it up again to see it. And uh, looking deeply. And let's not forget a basis for all of our uh, interviewees, especially those from Asia, uh, uh, Phil's book, American Veda. Uh, and also we want to mention, as long as we're mentioning his books, his book on uh, Yogananda. So all of that available. All that Over my up. shoulder here. Over here, um, right back here. And, and uh, yeah, we're going to have some, uh, uh, later in the year, we'll have a, uh, uh, a, a, uh, guest or two to talk about Yogananda because it's the right. 50th anniversary of autobiography uh, of a yogi coming up. Uh, a book Not 50, 75th, 75th. Many, many, so, many, many people we know. So And uh, listeners, click that subscribe button. Yeah, subscribe by the way, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on the podcast, please do that. And uh, spiritmatterstalk.com, go there. Help keep us on the air. Uh, we are your contributions will be greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, those that have given, we want to thank. Uh, we're not a nonprofit. It's not a donation. It's a contribution, but it keeps us going. And uh, I think our, our, our archives have great value. And we have close, we're moving in on 300 interviews uh, in those archives and available and free to people worldwide. And we get emails from all over the world. So people are listening and we want to keep it going. Hundreds of years from now, people will be listening and Hundreds. saying, oh, this might, this was a great contribution to humanity. <laughs> no, I wasn't alive then to contribute is what they'll think. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Uh, Phil, okay. until next time. Next time. All right.